Dr. Misko is co-owner and president of Core Healthcare out in Dripping Springs, Texas. He's specialized in neuropsychology for the past, past 15 years. His time and energy have been mainly helping to improve the quality of life for people who've survived traumatic brain injuries and other devastating neurological disorders. Besides coordinating treatment at CORE and a number of other programs, Dr. Misko lectures nationally and throughout Texas, endeavoring to raise awareness of brain injury related issues. In appreciating these efforts, the Brain Injury Association of Texas awarded him the 2003 Professional Contribution of the Year. Dr. Misko is past chair of the American Academy for the Certification of Brain Injury Specialist, a standing committee of the Brain Injury Associated Asian America, and is a board member of that same uh, association. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up Dr. Misko. So this is the inevitable consequence of being the last speaker. I have 10 minutes. <laughs> no, actually, really, it's OK, because um, uh, I'll, I'll certainly take more than 10 minutes. But uh, this, is, uh, yeah, this, is, this is part of actually a larger talk that's primarily designed for clinicians and facilities that are wanting to improve their practice uh, by understanding and implementing treatments that are based on neuroplastic principles. Uh, as far as we know, that are available. <clears throat> like Dr. Bigler, I'll, I'll start with two quotes quickly. Plasticity, this is by Dr. Pasquale Plasticity is an intrinsic property of the nervous system, retained throughout the lifespan. It's not possible to understand normal psychological function or the manifestations and consequences of disease without invoking the concept of brain plasticity. Dr. He, uh, at uh, NIH, she said, finally, recovery of function involves, will involve, the reorganization of entire brain networks. Rehabilitation may restore the networks to a normal state or enable a new state in which functions are performed through compensatory strategies. Um, Neuroplasticity is and will do more of changing the face of rehabilitation than anything that we've ever experienced since we began to try to treat people who've had traumatic brain injuries. And it certainly has uh, begun to permeate not only the culture of neuroscience, but neuroplasticity is permeating the culture of our society. And I say that because my wife just yesterday happened to hear a children's toy radio commercial bring up the concept of neuroplasticity. I could not believe it. Um, and it's hard not to be excited. The, you know, you look at those, the imaging that Dr. Bigler uh, and his colleagues were able to create and utilize and use that to begin to understand the functionality of the brain. It's astonishing. You know, in 30 years, we went from believing that wasn't possible to now we have that. Uh, in the same way, 30 years ago, we didn't believe that the adult human, that the adult brain changed. And now we all know better, and it's been embraced entirely by the neuroscience community. But there's, unfortunately, a very large gap between basic science and clinical standard practice. NIH is uh, one of their translational experts, estimates that it, would, that it normally takes a good idea, a good basic science idea to go to inform and change clinical practice takes about 20 years. Now, that's uh, just too long, and I, I speak out of a sense of frustration, not only for myself and all the colleagues that I work with that do rehabilitation, but also, of course, for all of our consumers, all of our patients that have been waiting, millions in this country with brain injury, waiting for something to improve their circumstances neurobiologically. And of course, you know, there are unfortunately new survivors coming every day. The frustration is helpful because what I'm finding is that therapists are um, reaching out much more actively into basic science, looking in the journals, which is not necessarily what, what we always have time to do. Um, but they are doing their best to try to extract whatever useful clinical information is in that basic science that they might, with some sense of confidence and making sure that it's safe, to try to apply that in their own rehab settings. Now, 
Um, as Dr. Bigler touched on some of this, I'm not going to spend hardly any time, but these are just examples of the different targets that neuroscientists uh, can aim at. Synapses, dendritic changes, reinforcing of silent connections that, that are not working but still surviving, using other pathways to uh, improve uh, function, and of course neurogenesis developing new brain cells. And not only can the neuroscientists work on those factors, but they have all of these factors sort of globally working down from the functioning, the global functioning of the brain and its health, down to neuronal health, down to intracellular and, in, and internally and externally how the cells are operating with each other, and of course biochemical and ultimately genetic uh, issues. All of these are what neuroscientists are, are actively researching. And, um, <clears throat> That explains why in the last five years there's been 15,000 articles written about neuroplasticity. That's really an unbelievable number. It's also unbelievably impossible to keep up with that information. Now, um, for clinicians, there's no easy way to extract clinical information. Um, you do searches, but there's no journal that is, has a title that says, Here's the really important clinical information you need to know. <clears throat> but having, having spent a great deal of time trying to find that information, I, have a, I can speak confidently that of those 13 to 15,000 articles, about only one, maybe two percent of those have clinically relevant information, things that we could read and say, I'm going to try something like that with my client. So maybe 150 to 300 articles that are out there. Now fortunately, unlike the neuroscientists, clinicians have a much smaller set of targets. And this is really radical information. It doesn't look like it because I don't have fancy pictures like Dr. Bigler does. But I can tell you that what I, this slide is so profoundly different than what clinicians learn uh, as they go through the graduate program and, and their clinical experience. They focus historically what functions work, what functions don't work, and what do we try to do about that. In the future, hopefully not far away, and I don't think it will be far away, I think we'll certainly see it in my children's lifetimes, clinicians are going to be partly or primarily focused on a different set of targets and information. These, these are probably the majority of those targets. These are the areas that we might be able to do something about in order to improve the life of somebody with a brain injury. One is doing something about that focal area of damage, that spot where tissue uh, has been destroyed. Now for that, um, we're going to need those stem cells. But the other areas are things that we can and are already doing something about which is using nearby matter or matter in the other hemisphere that's similar in function to take over those functions of the damaged area. Ways to improve the white matter tracks, the cabling under the surface of that gray matter that connects all the different areas of the brain and the, the images of DTI that Dr. Bigler was showing. Maybe there's something we can do about those to strengthen or fix them. Functional networks, which is a very, very new uh, idea but it's a very important idea, and in fact, I'm going to sacrifice a, a fair amount of the other information so that we can talk a little bit more in depth about that. And then a part where um, we're confident that this is important, we just don't really know how well, how large a role it plays in rehab, and we probably won't for quite some time, which is that concept of global brain health, uh, the idea that there are certain uh, elements that are vitally important for a healthy or not healthy brain uh, in order to be able to change and learn uh, through experience, which includes, you know, all, all the things that sometimes we humans have find hard to do, like exercise, getting adequate sleep, nutrition. I certainly did not engage in those behaviors in the last week. <clears throat> now, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that you had exposed to this because um, there's something called non-invasive brain stimulation, which is an important tool in the, many of the articles that I'll touch on and in the future of our rehabilitation. Um, it's really uh, a pain for a lot of reasons. 
to stick electrodes through somebody's skull <clears throat> and activate brain tissue in that way. So even and though that we do do that, uh, and, and it can be incredibly helpful, but to find a way to reach out inside and touch that brain and activate it, either turning it on more or turning it lower, um, is, is a very helpful thing in terms of research. This is one example, transcranial magnetic stimulation. That little wand puts out a magnetic pulse. And as I said, it can stimulate or uh, diminish activity in particular brain regions. <clears throat> this is the other primary non-invasive stimulation, which is direct current stimulation. It's actually uh, pa passing electricity through areas of your brain. Uh, it's very, very low voltage, very uh, milliamps. Um, in fact, it can run off of a uh, nine volt battery. <clears throat> but it, it provides us interesting information. So um, what's out there in those, in that vast number of 150 to 300 articles or so that has clinical information that we're putting to use? Well, about 60% of that uh, goes back to that second target, which is reorganizing brain tissue, the function of brain tissue. Can I stimulate somehow or uh, cajole, convince brain tissue that's either nearby the damage or on the other side of my brain to take over the function and functions that have been lost because of my injury? There is a fair, you know, a fair amount of research that has positive outcomes. Um, it's fairly split evenly between language functions and motor functions. Um, but, but essentially what it has is that literature is able, has been able to document that there's spontaneous recovery, that reorganization can happen on its own without therapists getting involved, great. Right? Um, that uh, non-invasive non activation and therapy can really help this process of reorganization that's good. Um, there is, though, some concerns. One is that sometimes reorganization is not helpful. <clears throat> if my left arm is not working well, and um, my, one of my hemispheres takes over from the damaged area, but it's, you know, it wasn't as good as that first area, because it's sort of taking over this function it wasn't really wasn't designed to do, well, suppose my original site of injury really wasn't complete. Suppose we were able to repair that. Once that reorganization has happened and that area is not being relied upon, uh, that area begins to lose its functionality entirely. So reorganization is not entirely positive. In fact, um, if you were a survivor of a brain, of a brain injury and you were going through post-acute, well, acute, rehabilita uh, acute care, and then post-acute rehabilitation. That's a very difficult, often unpleasant thing to do. And you begin to learn a lot of things that aren't necessarily in your best interest in terms of your behavior and your thinking. Well, that learning is plasticity. That learning is changing your brain. There are things that happen to clients, to patients, um, that begins to change them in ways that uh, operate against their own best interest. So there's Reorganization cuts both ways, and so we have to understand how to, how to um, change back some of the ways when reorganization has not been helpful. There, there are two very recent studies, though, that I'll just touch on. Uh, one's 2012 and 2011, where they used one of the uh, tools for uh, non-invasive activation. They coupled that with therapy. They did it uh, in a fairly intense protocol. And they were able to uh, image, looking at fun functional imaging, showed improved activation in the areas that uh, provide support and function of language. So, these are the kind of studies that give us hard information. If you do this kind of therapy, it is likely to result in these kinds of neurobiological changes, and that's what you want. So that's happening. Same thing is, is true for motor. Um, 
There's a great deal of studies having to do with motor functioning. They're a lot like language. We know that sometimes things spontaneously improve. <clears throat> we know that reorganization happens on its own. We know that there are ways that we can support that therapeutically. Uh, in particular, which some of you may be acquainted with, CIT, chronic uh, constraint induced therapy. <clears throat> Just to show you, we'll see. So, you know, they, uh, they tie up or restrain somehow your good arm. They let you struggle for a very long time, four to eight hours a day for many days in a row, keeping your, your good arm tied up for 90% of your waking hours. That's very intense experience. Uh, let's see if we go back. The, um, and, oh yeah, that's right. Um, and, and so what they find in some of those studies, now that we're beginning to pair those with imaging, either structural or functional, is that indeed um, there is a beginning to be returns of function and that those are correlated with gray matter, increases in gray matter, increases in the cortex of your brain. So we've got brain tissue that's somehow improving and we have functional improvement as well. In fact, one of the ones they did was uh, very touching, they uh, had worked with children that had hem hemiplegia from birth, from congenital uh, brain trauma. And they did this same thing, but for only four hours per day. But they still tied up that other good arm, that good side for 90% of their waking hours. <clears throat> and in fact, they had fairly significant improvements that nobody had really uh, been able to accomplish with these children. Uh, and, and indeed, they were in that those functional increases uh, improvements were correlated with MR, fMRI activation studies. <clears throat> I'm just throwing this in there because it's another one of those tools that uh, is on the verge of either being junk science or in fact, wow, this is really an effective tool that is able to change, uh, change the brain and restore functioning. Uh, when you have different, certain types of brain injuries, you'll get a field cut where you can't see part of the world. Those have been extremely resistant to fix. They're a very big problem. They reduce people's qualities of life. They result in uh, greater risk of injuries. There have been many attempts to try to improve them. It's, the argument's kind of gone back and forth. This is how they do this visual restoration therapy. They fix your head, fix your gaze, and begin to flash lights in different fields to try to uh, provoke, uh, encourage, that field, your, your primary brain, your occipital lobe, to take on more functioning, to be able to see more of the world, hopefully. Um, the gold standard recently, a review by Dr. Gold in 2012, uh, said, forget it, this, doesn't, this is not working, it's hoax. But he left out two articles, one in 2010 and 2012, that seemed to follow all of the guidelines that he had suggested following in order to get good information. And in fact, both of those articles found fairly significant positive results. Now, we don't have structural evidence to say, oh, yes, that's because we can see that the occipital cortex that controls vision, yeah, that's actually becoming activated and taking over some of uh, that visual functioning that's been lost and is improving that cut. But they're on the verge of doing that, and, and accordingly, there's supposed to be a study started sometime this, this year, much like these, that they'll do imaging to understand if that's really happening. Um, you know, when I first began um, 15 years ago seeing uh, articles having to do with mental imagery in neuroscience, you know, you kind of go, hmm, what's that about? Uh, but, and now they've sort of changed the name to mental practice. And of course, you know, athletes have been using this for, you know, decades to improve their, their abilities. But um, mental practice in neuroscience may have a very important role. Um, because if there's not a way to externally activate brain tissue, if I can make a picture in my mind of me closing my hand and without doing it, I activate those areas that have to do with being able to close your hand, if I can activate those areas myself with my imagery, then I am supporting, hopefully, the redevelopment or reorganization of that area and hopefully will bring back some function. They're beginning to use this in motor uh, abilities, language functionings. Um, there are numerous studies supporting its efficacy. Uh, 
the, um, not so much in language, mostly in motor, but there really is a lack of guidelines because, you know, how do you write up protocols for something that only happens in your, in your, in your head? Uh, how, how I, as a scientist, am able to say, well, yes, you're doing a good job with mental practice, so are you, but no, you really need to change that picture in your head. Well, of course, we really can't do that, um, but maybe. Because uh, a recent study paired away, paired an imaging procedure that was able to look at um, that, those areas of my brain that activate when I close my hand. So it said, okay, we know that these areas are really involved when he is doing this. Okay, now, Jim, we're not going to have you close your hand. We're going to want you to image that in your mind. And we're going to check to see if those same areas are the ones uh, that operate when you really close your hands. So is my, whatever I'm imaging, who knows? But ideally, I would be imaging my hand closing, and ideally, it would activate those same areas for that motor task. But they also did something else, which was they used that same imaging technology to provide neural feedback. And so they provided their subjects with a way to know whether or not they're succeeding in activating the right areas by using, essentially, biofeedback to teach me that I'm on the right path. Uh, and they had very positive results from that and found, in fact, quite good um, uh, correspondence between the mental imagery areas of activation and the hand areas of activation. So if we have a way of actually sort of measuring people's success using mental imagery, it might become a very important part of the uh, clinical treatments that we utilize. Now, um, so reorganization, as the primary uh, group of clinical articles out there that, that offer some chance of success in practice, um, we still have, to, you know, there's a lot that we don't know. We don't know, uh, you know, which functions are, are most amenable to, to reorganization, uh, what areas of the brain might or might not uh, have that be as a possibility. Uh, when to use reorganization versus maybe if the area is not completely damaged, we should try to, you know, work on repairing that area. But, but it is certainly one of the best resources that we have right now as clinicians. Now, white matter tracks, and there's just the white matter and, and network functioning, and uh, then I'll be done. Um, white matter tracks, very little information. We know that they spontaneously can grow back. We know also by studying epileptic uh, surgical patients that uh, when there has been that uh, a resection, they remove some brain tissue, that sometimes white matter tracts in the surrounding areas will grow and branch out. So we know that they change in the adult brain. We're not quite sure how, how to do that ourselves, but there were two articles recently. Uh, they took children with poor reading skills, did a very intensive one ho 100 hours of remedial reading instruction. I don't know how they got those kids to do, do that in a very short period of time. Um, but in fact, and then they imaged the white matter tracts and they was improved and increased in density in the, in the, or number in the areas that have to do with reading. And they were connecting those reading areas uh, in a way that allowed the children to have improved reading abilities, or at least they were correlated with that. Um, also, this was very impressive. In 2012, they took some very low-functioning uh, adult males with autism and essentially had been following them for six years with day-long intensive cognitive communication and behavioral remediation, uh, you know, really throwing everything they had, enriching their lives. Um, I don't know who paid for that, but it's wonderful. Um, the, um, and indeed, again, they found uh, with imaging uh, increased organization in between frontal and temporal areas. Tracks began to grow, become more capable at relaying information in the areas, and that was very well correlated with functional improvements in uh, what, were other, what would have been otherwise children that would not have been expected to make significant gains. <clears throat> And of course, you know, we, we, there's, there's so many things that we don't know about how to, about white matter uh, improvement. Um, there, all, all of the basic questions need to be asked. Uh, how, do, how does one facilitate that? Uh, 
um, how do you target specific areas and so forth. But, it, but at least it presents an option that we'll begin to have more information and be able to use that as clinicians. The last area, functional networks, I, I find, I, I think it's Im immensely important. And functional networks are cortical areas that are connected because they contribute to certain functions. But they don't have to be directly physically connected. They're corrected in t connected in time. We know that when we functionally scan those areas, they're operating together in a cohesive way in order to do certain things. They're essentially agreed upon, although I'm, this might be open to change, because again, this is fairly new information, last few years. Um, on, on seven of these, a default mode, which is sort of what's happening uh, when all of the other networks aren't activated, there's the default mode, and that's its own network. And other things, salience, having to do with the issues of, of what's relevant uh, and, and it operates with, in opposition to the default mode, but executive control, visual, auditory, sensory motor, attention, those are the primary networks uh, that we've determined exist even when you're resting. So if I'm not doing anything, my visual network doesn't go away. It's there. In fact, it's waiting, hopefully. Um, and you can image these in a regular MRI. You basically just put somebody in and they're laying there quietly and not doing anything. And you do imaging and analysis and you're able to isolate, separate these networks that are always there. And they don't just do their own thing, but the relationship between these networks is vitally important. I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, so we do know that changes in these networks, such as you see after a traumatic brain injury, are probably very important. We don't understand well yet what they mean. But um, one, one, one small possibility, just sort of hypothetical, some of the research that we do at CORE um, in a small study looking at resting state networks, um, it seemed that the uh, default mode, when you're just in resting state in an MRI and you're looking at that one particular network, it uh, was operating with, with, uh, in too much, too powerfully. And maybe what was happening, it was suppressing the other networks or not allowing them to be in a state of readiness that they should be. Well, you know, I, I, I know this is just common sense, but what's one of the things very, that traumatic brain injury clients have uh, difficulty with is being able to switch their attention and to begin to engage in some other aspect of their environment or what they want to do or what somebody else wants them to do. Um, maybe that is happening as a result of these networks that should always be cohesively cooperating, not cooperating very well. Now, what's really exciting about this is that it appears that there may be ways that we'll figure out to begin to change the activation of these networks and how they get along. In 2009, Lewis did this study where they took people uh, who had no medical problems and they taught them a certain visual task. And they trained them over nine days and did over 5,000 trials to teach them how to do this task so that they were right 80% of the time. Now, one of the, uh, one of the aspects of this task is that um, they had to learn to ignore a whole bunch of their visual field except for this one area, and then they had to, in that area, learn how to pick out a certain figure very quickly. What their findings were, in kind of in order, they assert that, of course, learning sculpts the connectivity of the existing functioning, functioning networks. Uh, trained visual cortex area and those frontal attention areas uh, that were independent before training became negatively correlated. And basically, just what that means is that they were beginning to uncouple. So, I, at first, if I was doing that training, I'd say, man, I gotta look over this whole area Oh, but if it's over here, okay, I'll ignore that. Okay, I'll ignore that. I'll, I don't even need to tell myself anymore that I ignore it. 
I just do it. It's sort of like when your golf swing finally gets good enough to you don't have to think about it. I haven't experienced that myself. But, um, but you, you really no longer need to pay attention. That was one of the things that they found in their analysis, was that those two networks learned to not pay so much attention to each other on this task. Um, but also that the, um, the, the default mode, that the one that's kind of going all of the time and doing some of the orchestrating possibly with these other networks, um, began to subsist so that the other network, that visual network, was able to do its job more efficiently. So basically, what, what these people are, what, what these researchers are saying about functional network is that, um, that they may increase and decrease in strength based upon the experiences and the learning that you have. And that by measuring these networks and how they're, what, what their activation levels are and how they respond to experience and how they are working together, that that begins to be a way not only to measure and predict some of the problems our brain injury survivors might have, but if we can alter the relationships of those networks like, like they all did, then maybe we begin to help them in some very substantial ways, even if specific areas of their brain are damaged. If we could help the clients, that, that one client that we had in particular, whose other networks didn't seem to be able to be ready to respond to information, maybe that becomes the first goal. We have changes to where network balancing becomes what we have to pay attention to first so that those other networks that are gonna learn all these other rehab methods are able to do their job in a better way than if we don't address that problem from the beginning. So, looking back over, over the articles that, that I've reviewed, some important themes from successful studies, studies that used a treatment method, used good neuro, neuroimaging to look at is this working in a way that it's changing a person's brain? We have found that indeed uh, change is possible at all structural and functional levels. It's not a question anymore. We know that it's possible. We have, we have that, um, that data to prove that. We also know that appropriate activation or innervation or turning it down of target areas is crucial. And that misdirected efforts in, in rehab or in life that doesn't do it the right way um, can have deleterious effects, can get in the way of learning and make behavior, again, not in the best interest of the client. So we have to think about the, how to appropriately activate or deactivate target areas. In the absence of external activation, like those wands of transcranial magnetic stimulation and direct hair stimulation, uh, the direct, uh, yeah, interventions must be made highly salient to the patient. So if, if you um, are not using an external way of activating brain tissue, then and you want me to do it as a, ther you're a therapist, and you want me as a brain injury client to really work hard to activate and wake up and excite certain areas of my brain, I, it has to be made very important to me. And that's no, it's difficult to do in, in the field of brain injury. Because neuroplastic change is likely to require very frequent and very intense therapeutic trials to make those neuroplastic changes happen. And it was interesting to see that in uh, uh, a 2010 study, uh, that the number of rehab sessions that are typically given to clients no, typically nowhere near matches what the research would support. I mean, it was like half of what is used in neuroplastic research to make your brain change. Um, therapists under one year weren't very good at that. Therapists over 15 years weren't very good about that. The ones in between were somewhat better. So finally, uh, the last two slides, what do we need to know? Well, a lot needs to change in the country. We need improved neuroscience training for frontline therapists, and that includes neuropsychologists, which is I am, PTs, OTs, speech, um, that's not something we're typically introduced to adequately, but going forward, especially if we're going to make use of the kind of information that 
Dr. Bigler and his type are able to give us, we need to be able to speak that language. We need to know what real-time neuroimaging information is useful to the therapeutic team. How do we use that information when we're making our treatment plans? Um, what are the best practice guidelines for frequency, intensity, duration of interventions? And of course, the degree of impact of some of those other aspects of brain health, about exercise, diet, sleep, and stress, how important are they? Motivation, hopefulness. They might be vitally important, more important than we realize. A lot of things have changed, so we need to keep an open mind. And also, what are some of the common negative neuroplastic changes that result from the process of recovery and treatment, and what to do about those? So, what tools are we going to need to do this? We need clinically relevant studies, a lot more of them as quickly as possible. Um, hopefully NIH will continue to push translational studies that will give us the type of information we need as clinicians to make a change in our patients' lives. We need innovative therapies that can take advantage of opportunities for this reorganization and reconnection, probably different uh, substantially than what we do now. Uh, we need, and if anybody could find, give me examples of this, next one, I think there's a $10,000 reward, which is con constraint-induced therapy analogs for cognitive functioning. We have something sort of similar that we can do in language functioning, but how do you tie up the good part of a person's memory ability and force them to use the bad part or force them to use their problem solving? Well, maybe, maybe we can't, but one of the ways that we're going to hopefully lure people into doing that are by using virtual reality and, and advanced software gaming technologies. You look at software right now that does cognitive rehab, and it looks like Pong, that game that I used to play when I was a kid, you know? I mean, it's, it's so simple and so unmotivating. You know, I had 10 minutes, on five minutes, I don't want to bother with it. It's ridiculous when we can use gaming technology that children use and really pull people into that experience and use that software to begin to train them in ways and improve their attention and memory and so forth. And of course, virtual reality would be nice, and there are some very significant efforts at this. Um, in fact, the Department of Defense has put a great deal of money into the VA system, and they have a system that's uh, very impressive. Down in San Antonio is an example of one. Uh, we're going to need periodic neuroimaging throughout the treatment effort. If if we're going to take our cue as clinicians from the imaging data, well, then we're going to need updates. We image them, try some treatment, re-image. Oh, we did this well. We need to do this, change this. And that's going to need to go back and forth. And of course, somebody's going to need to pay for that. And the time it takes to make those changes happen, we don't know. Maybe we'll be more efficient. Maybe we'll discover that it takes much longer, but we'll be able to get a person back much further than we have ever believed we could. So we're going to need adequate insurance coverage and you know, other types of funding to allow those goals to happen. And of course, we're going to need that stem cell implantation as soon as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. So you know, I am very enthusiastic. We are changing clinical practice somewhat, but it's still painstakingly slow. We could see that light at the end of the tunnel, but we're personally, as therapists, just, just beginning to come out of the shadows. Thank you.